Hey folks, this is JR with DIY Prepper. Welcome to the channel. When it comes to events like EMPs, most of the time we tend to focus on the man-made side of things. Like I've done several videos over the effects that one caused by a high altitude nuclear detonation would have. But many times we tend to overlook the danger posed by natural phenomena that can cause very similar problems. Right now we're towards the middle of solar cycle 25. It started in 2019 and is expected to end in around 2030 with the predicted solar maximum or peak of solar activity to be in July of this year. Now we already had quite a bit of solar activity from August to October of last year so there is a chance that we've already gotten past solar maximum but if we haven't then this summer could be very, very active. Increased solar activity can mess with communications technology, GPS systems, and even the power grid. So today, we're gonna talk about what solar storms are, what kind of damage they can do, and some things that I'll be doing to prepare. The sun, just like the Earth, goes through different weather cycles. While we have things like El Nino and La Nina, the sun has what we call solar cycles. In the middle of those cycles, which is kind of where we are now, tend to be the most active. If you had the right equipment, you could see more sunspots, which are those darker, cooler areas on the surface of the sun, and those are where solar flares and coronal mass ejections, also called CMEs, come from. Solar flares are characterized by high levels of radiation and light being released from the sun, while CMEs expel plasma and magnetic fields. Between the two of them, CMEs are considered more dangerous since they release more material and energy into space. Now, thankfully, not every solar flare or CME is aimed at us. Space is pretty honking big, so most of them don't even get close to us. But when one does hit Earth, it can cause all sorts of not-so-fun problems like disrupting radio communications, knocking out satellites, and even overloading parts of our power grid. Now, how much damage a solar flare or CME can cause depends on a couple of things, like how strong the solar storm is and how directly it hits our planet. A weak solar flare that grazes Earth isn't going to cause nearly as much damage as a powerful CME that just hits a smack in the face. But even moderate solar activity can cause noticeable problems, especially when it comes to our communication systems. For starters, solar storms can disrupt high-frequency radio signals. That includes everything from aviation and maritime communications to ham radio. Pretty much anything that depends on bouncing signals off of the atmosphere. If the storm's strong enough, it can create what's called a radio blackout, where those frequencies just stop working altogether for a while, and in a worst-case scenario, that could last for days, especially up in polar regions. Next, you've got GPS, and a lot of folks don't realize how fragile those systems really are and how helpless they are without them. If you're someone who needs GPS getting from your house to Costco and back, then bless your heart, you may not survive if there's a CME. But increased solar radiation can mess with satellite signals, which could lead to errors in navigation, and that could mean much worse things than you accidentally ending up in the next county because you have no sense of direction. It could also impact aircraft, ships, and even precision farming systems that rely on having accurate GPS data. And then there's the power grid. Strong solar storms can actually induce electrical currents into power lines, which could cause transformers and other pieces of equipment to overload. That was the cause of the Quebec blackout in 1989. Millions of people lost power from an event that only lasted a couple of minutes. But since that time, we've become a lot more connected, and that makes us a lot more vulnerable to these kinds of events. Now, we're going to get into what a worst-case scenario would look like here in just a minute, but being connected the way that we are can be dangerous in other ways as well. Since our world has become so dependent on computers, huge amounts of information are available about us online. I've been using Delete Me for well over a year now to help keep my online information secure, and I'd like to thank them for sponsoring us today. Collecting personal data is a huge industry worth billions of dollars. I'm sure most of y'all have searched for your name online and have been able to find out things like your address and who your family members are. But if somebody's willing to pay a little bit of money, they can get access to a lot more than that. And the websites and data brokers that sell your information don't care who they're selling it to either. It could be a prospective employer, the creepy guy who wouldn't stop staring at you in high school and I was an internet creeper, or a criminal who wants to steal your identity or scam one of your loved ones. But there are things that you can do to protect your personal information. Delete Me will reach out to the different data broker websites and request to have your information removed. 
since I started using them, they removed my information from numerous sources, and they also continue to monitor them so that it doesn't pop back up later on. Some of the places that they checked were websites I had never even heard of before, so they're very thorough. If I'd tried to do all of that myself, it would have taken a ton of time, and I probably would have missed a few spots on top of all that. I think that they're an excellent service to use, and if you want to check them out, then you can use this link and code to get 20% off. Now, the worst case scenario we could face from a solar storm would be if a large coronal mass ejection, or CME, were to hit Earth dead on. If that were to happen, the effects that we'd see on the ground would be very similar to those from an EMP caused by um, high-altitude nuclear detonation. It would cause way bigger issues than your Wi-Fi going down or Siri not giving you the right directions. There could be massive long-term damage to the power grid and anything connected to it. And while we haven't experienced something like this in modern times, it has happened before. The Carrington event, which happened in 1859, was the strongest solar storm on record. Telegraph systems failed all over the world, some caught fire, and operators were reportedly shocked by their own equipment. And keep in mind that that was way back when electricity wasn't even widely used yet. Now fast forward to today and just imagine what a similar storm would do to our modern tech-saturated lives with power lines all over the place. Everything from satellites to substations would be affected. We could lose communications, internet, GPS, and power in large regions, possibly for weeks or even months depending on how hard we get hit and how well prepared utilities are, which they probably won't be. It will affect our ability to grow and transport food, treat water, provide medical care, and a lot more important stuff. We actually almost had a similar event happen in 2012. A massive CME just barely missed Earth, and if it had hit us, experts say it could have caused damage on the scale of trillions of dollars. But since it didn't, most folks never even heard about it. So while we don't need to panic, we do need to be realistic. It's also worth noting that an EMP caused by a CME may not be as severe as one caused by a high-altitude nuclear detonation. There's a chance it may not damage smaller electronics, but for me personally, I'm going to go ahead and prepare for a worst-case scenario just to make sure that my family's covered no matter what. Like with any other event, having plenty of food, water, and medication stored at our home is going to be essential, but since this is an event that will directly affect technology, it's a good idea to take steps to protect your most important pieces of equipment. One of the first things that comes to mind is a backup power source. Because if a situation lasts long enough, it's not going to matter if your radios or LED lanterns still work if you can't keep them powered up to last as long as you need them to. And even though it may be difficult to protect a larger power option, small power stations are still pretty doable. Then you'll want to protect some radios. Ham radios are always good to have, but I also really like my handheld GMRS radios I got towards the end of last year. My entire family can use them since they're covered under my GMRS license, and they can also pick up local FM and NOAA weather stations. Lights are also important to have, and I actually did a full video on the kinds of devices that you'd want to protect, and I'll be sure to link to that at the end of this video. Now, when it comes to how to protect your equipment, the basic principle is going to be the same whether we're dealing with a man-made EMP or the aftermath of some sort of solar storm. You want to block as much electromagnetic energy as possible from reaching your devices. The fancy word for this is attenuation, which basically means reducing or weakening a signal. And one of the best ways that you can do that is to put your devices in a Faraday cage. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you may have seen the video that I did a while back showing how to build one using a steel trash can. It's a cheap, practical solution that can protect a decent amount of gear, including small solar generators. But with the possibility of increased solar activity coming up, I thought now was a good time to go ahead and upgrade certain aspects of my Faraday cage. In my original version, I used heavy-duty aluminum foil to serve as a gasket around the top of the trash can. It was meant to help seal up any gaps between the can and the lid, and that actually did a pretty good job. You had to use enough layers of foil to make it work, though. If you only put like one or two around the top, it probably wouldn't do a whole lot of good. But if you added more, your results would be a lot better. And yes, you do need a gasket inside of your lid or conductive tape around the outside of your can. If you've seen the EMP doctor, he did a video several years back showing the difference in attenuation between a steel trash can with a gasket 
and one without, and the one with the gasket or tape around the edge had a significantly higher level of attenuation. But while my aluminum foil hack did work, it's not the best long-term solution. Over time, the foil will conform to the shape of the cannon lid and stop providing as good of a seal. So to deal with this, I went ahead and ordered an actual conductive gasket to replace the foil. That should give me a better seal and stronger protection. For installation, I cleaned out the inside of the lid to remove any dust or other debris that could have been there, and then I applied the gasket to its inner rim. And as I went around it, I tried to keep the edge of the gasket as close to the top of the lid as possible. I've put the lid on and taken it off a few times already, and the adhesive seems to be holding up pretty well. The only part that I'm a little worried about is where the two ends of the gasket meet up. I did a slight overlay there, but I also ordered some Faraday fabric, which I'll show y'all here in a minute, and it came with some conductive tape. If that edge starts to have issues, I'll just use that tape to repair it. Now, if you wanna get a gasket like this, I'll be sure to put a link to it in the description below, but you need to get the thin one. You want the one that's 90 by 0.75 by 0.25, and even that's almost a little too thick. Once you put the lid on all the way, it's gonna be kinda of difficult to take it off, and you do have to use some force when you're putting the lid on. I don't think that the thicker one would work very well but once you have it installed the gasket seems to do a pretty good job it stopped the signal from the find my phone feature along with the signal from a two-way radio from a few feet away i'm hoping that this will be a good long-term solution that'll work a little bit better than the aluminum foil did then another thing I'm going to do, at least for my more critical items, is that I'll be placing them inside of secondary Faraday bags before I put them into the Faraday cage. That'll give me multiple layers of attenuation, sort of like Russian nesting dolls, and that'll just help keep them covered in case like the gasket fails or something else goes wrong with my Faraday cage. Here I have a couple of Mission Darkness Faraday bags, and I really like these. They're the best out of the different bags that I've tested so far. I think that their conductive fabric is a little heavier duty and seems to block more signals. They're also the ones who made the gasket that I showed a second ago. In this one, I have a Geiger counter that's mainly for if we get hit by a man-made EMP, since nuclear ground strikes could very well potentially follow one of those. Then in this one, I have a small ham radio. Just keep in mind, though, that bags like these can wear out, especially if you're using them a lot. So be sure to test them out around like once a year or so just to make sure that they're still blocking signals. I also have a larger dry bag that I got from GoDark. I use it to hold some additional radios, battery operating motion sensors, and their base station. One downside to Faraday bags, though, is that they're pretty pricey, especially if you get the bigger ones. But one way around this is to wrap a cardboard box in a few layers of heavy-duty aluminum foil. I did that to protect some of my solar panels, but you can do it on a smaller scale with extra Amazon boxes you may have lying around the house or something like that. I found that three layers of heavy-duty foil will stop most cell signals, but I went ahead and used five just to be safe. You can then place those boxes inside of your Faraday trash can. Now, one large and very critical item I keep in here is a small solar power station. It came with its own backpack, which is nice since I can use that to carry my other tech items if I need to bug out. Unfortunately, though, that backpack won't do anything to protect it from an EMP or solar flare, and Faraday bags big enough to hold the power station are kind of expensive. So instead, I picked up the Faraday fabric I told y'all about a minute ago. I didn't do anything too fancy here. I just wrapped it up and then taped it closed. I tried to use the conductive tape that came with it where I could, but there wasn't enough. So I also used some masking tape to kind of hold down places where it overlapped. Of course, that, that masking tape isn't going to do anything to block signals, but it can help keep the different parts of the conductive cloth in contact with each other, which will help create that barrier. And then I just slid the whole thing back down into the backpack. But then there's some other things that I may do later to help make my Faraday cage a little more effective. Like right now I'm using cardboard as insulation inside of the can, but I may upgrade that to some thicker rubber in the future. Like I may use stall mats or something like that. And then I may ground it. That's a little hard to do since I keep my Faraday cage inside of the house. But if I did do that, it would give electrical charges an escape pass so they don't build up on the side of the Faraday cage. There is some debate, though, as to how necessary grounding one actually is. Now, if you want to see full instructions for how I built my Faraday cages, then click here. Or if you want to see items that you should keep inside of a Faraday cage, then click here. Once again, I'd like to thank Delete Me for sponsoring us today. Thank you all for stopping by. Y'all have a good night.